Hi, good morning, church. Morning, church. God bless you. Uh, really happy to be able to see you uh, and happy to have this time to connect. And uh, greetings also to those of you online. Uh, really good to have you uh, uh, join us also during this time. And I really pray that God will speak to us a word as a church and as, as individuals as well. Uh, whether you are here on site or whether you are there online, wherever you are, I just hope you prepare your hearts, you know, uh, quieten the environment around with your children or your family, loved ones, whether you're in your living room or, or other places, and just prepare your hearts that the Lord will come and minister to us. I really want to thank uh, Pastor Sabrina, Pastor Andrew for their kind invitation for me to be able to share God's word uh, with us uh, today. And I want to start by uh, really uh, sharing a vision with you. I want to share with you uh, a vision from God's word about building up God's church. A vision which is very powerful and it, it will transform uh, RCA if you allow God to speak to you. How many of you want to see uh, your church really growing, touching lives and changing the community? Can I see your hands? Amen? And I think that that's very precious, you know, and I just trust that the Lord uh, will, will speak something to you. Turn to someone next to you uh, and say to them today, open your, uh, open your heart to God's word today. Would you do that? Just say it to someone. Those of you online, so turn to someone, your loved one, uh, children or spouse, say it to them as well. Open your heart to God's word. You know, uh, when a friend of mine uh, was in London, uh, he witnessed a conservation movement. And it, this movement was to protect an old church building where people were, were there to preserve this uh, building called St. George's Church because something had happened in the foundations and the church building was slowly sinking and sinking, you know. Uh, and so there was a demonstration. Everybody went around and the people were holding up placards, you know, and, and chanting, save the church, save the church, save the church. And I thought, wow, my friends thought so funny you know, because I thought the church was supposed to save people, not people save the church. But during COVID-19, such a vision actually is more important than ever. That, that the church is called to save people. Communities all over the world face uncertainty. You know, they, they face depression. They even face sickness and death. And we, we, we read of so many situations. You know, my heart goes out. I've been trying to help a church in India during this time. But because of all that's happening, I don't even know how to talk to them during this because of, of the, the thousands of people who are falling sick every time. And you know, and this is a time where the church needs to rise up to really share the love of Christ. This is a time, you know, when, when the church is, it's not a time for the church to hunker down, you know. Let's hunker down, let's wait until everything gets over. Two years later, we will get back again, you know. By then, the war over already, correct? So now is the time where God's power will come to help your church share the message of God's love and hope to your loved ones, to your families, and to the community around. And we're really going to ask that the, the Holy Spirit will do this work. So let me pause here for a word of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to really speak to us a deep word, to the church, to each of us here on site as well as online. Let, let me pray for us. Father, we just want to commit this time to you. I want to pray for your Holy Spirit to really come and that you will minister to us and you will really open the heavens and share your heart. I just know that you have a special word for your church. And I know, I know you want to do something special for Risen Christ Assembly. So let your Holy Spirit come and speak to us. Open our hearts to your word and open your word to our hearts. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what is the church of God? What is this church of God that's supposed to be like? Is it a building? Is it a people? If you're going to paint a picture of a healthy, vibrant church, uh, what would that picture look like? Would it have a lot of people? Is that your picture of a, a healthy, vibrant church? We have great worship. And by the way, the worship today was great, wasn't it? Really, really uh, felt the presence of the Lord, you know. But is that the picture of a healthy church? Would it have great food? Would it have a great children's ministry or youth ministry? Now, I, I submit to you that all these things are some expressions of church health, but not health itself. What is a biblical picture of a healthy church? You see, RCA, if you cannot have a clear picture of a, 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 of a healthy church, what a church is supposed to look like in unity, then it's difficult for you to receive it. You'll be chasing after the forms. You'll be looking for different forms, which all can be facets of health, but it's not really health itself. And if you cannot see what health really is in the church, the vibrancy of, you will not be able to partner with God in growing that health in your church. And that's what we want to look uh, to at uh, God's word for God's revelation of this this morning. Uh, I want to invite you to open your Bibles. Okay, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Okay, turn with me to Matthew 16. Keep your finger there throughout our message because we'll be referencing uh, several 
uh, verses here and there uh, from that passage there. Those of you uh, uh, on on uh, line, you know, open your Bibles too. If you're sitting with your children or your loved ones, ask them to open and then we'll kind of look through God's Word together and, and then we'll read it together as well, okay? So I want to invite you. Okay, I'm going to read the scripture passage from Matthew 16, verses 13 through to 20. Those of you online, if you'd like to have your children read out loud with you or your family read out, that's a great thing to do also. So I'm just going to read it through. Just take that, that few seconds to read through with the family. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 20. For us uh, on site, I'll just read it for us, okay? Uh, and I uh, remind you, keep a finger there because we will reference this text throughout our time. So Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. I want to share with us this morning three traits of a church that prevails uh, from this passage today. My first thought is this, a prevailing church is a people who remember their mission. A people who remember their mission. Look with me at uh, your Bibles in the passage that we just read in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And the Bible tells us that this is a very earth-shattering remark, okay? And all of you who are, who are familiar with this, you'll know that it's something that, that Jesus revealed about, about what God was going to do through his church. But it happened in Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is a, it's a very pagan city. Okay, it's a city where many people worship many other gods. In the Jew, you know, in, in the Jewish territories, you know, where they've been ministering, the people of God have begun to see Jesus as the son of David, king of the Jews. But here, in a pagan city, where, you know, there were no uh, believers, as well, they were all pagans around, it's the first time that, that uh, Jesus is revealed as Christ the Son of the living God. And it's very interesting, isn't it? You would have thought that if God wanted to give a revelation of His identity, He would give it right in the heart of Jerusalem. You know, He would reveal it in the church anniversary. When the church has an anniversary, oh, there's a time when the revelation of God's uh, 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 authority will be revealed. But it's not. It happened in the outskirt, in the pagan city in Caesarea Philippi. Almost for, it's like someone went on a mission trip, you know, somewhere outside and then, a great vision of God was revealed there. Why? You know, it was almost like foretelling that one day Jesus Christ will reach these people for Christ. You following me? One day, these pagans will all come to know the Lord Jesus. The gospel will be preached to all the world. You know, and, and, and this revelation of God came not in a church Christian worship service, but more in a mission trip out somewhere or some retreat out in the pagan places uh, because it foretold that one day Jesus will lead his disciples to reach both Jews and unbelievers all over the world. Friends, on a deep level, I want to share something of God's heart with you. God doesn't care in a sense that the church is charismatic or liturgical, whether the prayer is done this way or that way or not, but whether things are getting into shape to reach the lost and to glorify the name of Jesus in the lives of people. Amen? You know, it's said that when fishermen don't fish, they start to fight. You know? They're supposed to cast nets, but after a while, they start to cast stones at each other. And that is why fishermen must remember their mission to catch fish. And Jesus called all his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And that's our life. That's our life mission in different, different ways because we're all wired differently. We're all put in different communities. But this is the mission. Turn to someone next to you and say to them, catch spiritual fish. Will you do that? A friend of mine told me he bought a fish tank. He was very proud of it. He bought three fish and put it in the tank. They were very happy. They swim among the corals. Then after six months, he said, so nice, I'm going to buy another three fish. He bought three more fish and put it in. And then you know what? The older fish attack the newer ones. 
Because the fish had established their territory already. You following me? Yeah, and, and they found the new ones, they usually huddle alone on one side or floating at the top, you know. And, and, and I tell you that there's a lesson that we learned that when God's people are not remembering their mission, they start to squabble, they start to uh, get too sophisticated for their own good. No, is this person really in charge? Is that person really in charge? Is this way better? Is that way better? Which do I prefer? And God's word is trying to tell us that something happens when the church says, we don't want to squabble, we don't want to get too sophisticated, we just want to reach the lost. Something happens that touches God's heart and it brings down God's blessing. RCA, do you want God's blessing? Can I see your hands? Yes? Amen? So in this case, out in pagan territory, the revelation of the identity of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, foretelling that one day the gospel will reach out to these very people. Blessed are you for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but the Spirit of my Father. It was in the context of a missional people that God gave a revelation of the fullness of the identity and calling of Jesus Christ. RCA, what is the mission that God gave you? When you first came to this church, you know, and maybe some of you followed uh, uh, coming out to plant this church, what was the mission that God gave you when you first started? Will you be a people who remember their mission? A second trait of a prevailing church that I want to share with us today is that such a church is a people whose leaders discern the presence and call of Christ and follow radically. A people whose leaders discern the presence uh, and call of Christ and follow radically. Look with me in your Bibles, verse 13 through to 16. Verse 13, uh, it says this, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, in those days, uh, the context was that there were numbers of peoples who were raising disciples of their own. They would go into the desert places, they would go into various places to have their own groups of disciples, and each would say, I come with a, a different revelation. And you know, the common thinking of the time, would, many would, were expecting the spirit of Elijah to come. And you know, so they asked, by, by what means do you disciple us? And the disciple, the discipler would say, uh, uh, I come in the spirit of Elijah, you know. Some would say, I'll have the spirit of Jeremiah. And that's why when Jesus asked his disciples, you know, some of you have, uh, who, who do people say I am? And they say, oh, maybe you are like that, so you're like, 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 like Elijah, you're like uh, Jeremiah. These were the, the traditional thinking, the, the popular thinking of that age. But uh, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? And then Peter replied with something of deep insight. Something that, that, as it were, went deeper than all the rest and, and, and went against, as it were, the traditional thinking of the age. Almost. You know, and, and it was a radical idea that was out of the box that kind of flew against everything and went so much deeper with great insight. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, Simon Peter, at that moment, could just forego all the traditional thinking and let the Spirit of the Father reveal something radical and out of the box to show us the presence and the voice of Jesus Christ. And I submit to you that the application for us is this. If RCA wants a spiritual breakthrough, then her leaders and her people need to seek the presence of Christ and hear Him clearly. And they must be committed to follow the voice of Jesus Christ radically. They must reach a point where they say, I'm convinced that this is what God has called us to do, not the other thing. This is what God has called us to do. You know, it may be out of the box. It may be something we have never done before. We don't even see any church around doing this. But if we sense it's God, we must dare to follow Him with radical obedience. Someone once said, you know, when churches die, the last seven words that's ever spoken by a church just before it dies uh, is, we have never done it this way before. You know, those seven words often spell the doom of a church. And we need to hear God clearly. If we are sure that this is the will of Jesus, it is the Lord Christ, the Son of the living God speaking, we must recognize as a leadership, as a people, His presence and follow His voice radically. Now, in that sense, I, I want to share a thought, uh, some thoughts with you about hearing and following God radically. And that is this. Okay? There are many good ideas, but few God ideas. There are many good ideas all around. You look at so many things happening, good. But there are few God ideas. The ideas that God said, you are my church in this season for this purpose and I'm calling you to move in this direction. 
So you may have all, all the, the great ideas, but only that which comes from the voice of Christ is from God. There were many ideas about Elijah and Jeremiah during the time, but there was only one Christ, the Son of the living God. The second thought I want to share with you about hearing or following God radically is this. When we hear God's voice, despite risk, it is a sure foundation we can trust. Look with me in your Bibles in verse 18. Jesus says in verse 18, I, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now the word Peter... Uh, some of you might know, actually means rock, you know. And it does not refer to pieces of rock. It refers to the solid foundation bedrock, completely filled, no holes, no gaps. It's like, you know, uh, you, you, you see, Jesus was playing around with the name Peter, you know, to communicate something. He's saying that when you, when you hear something that's a revelation of, of Christ and you follow, it's like standing on a sure foundation. It's like you, you know, you ask an engineer today, I, I want to build uh, an extension to this building. You invite an engineer to come, right? And the, the, the engineer uh, surveys the land and says, you know, you wanted to build it this way, but this part, the rock is, is only in patches. If you just extend it and turn it a little bit that way, that whole part is solid bedrock, solid foundation. If you build there, it will last. It's good and it's safe. And that's what it means, you know. God's revelation, when you receive and you follow it, is like solid bedrock. It's not like a patches of rock. It's a solid rock that, that is a trustworthy foundation. Because when Jesus speaks to you about your church, about your marriage, uh, about your, your work, and you feel that this is what God is saying to you, and you take a step to follow Him, it is a sure foundation to follow Him. Amen? And that's something very precious. You know, I remember when I was a uh, uh, pastor at Shed, that I, I consult for churches. COVID-19 struck all churches, big and small, were, were struggling. During this time, I struggled with the, this, this, this. I was very burdened for these new challenges that, that churches were going through and what they faced. And I was also very stressed because my current model of helping churches uh, was affected. But over time, I began to seek the Lord and began to develop an online module for coaching churches. And I was really burdened to help uh, churches sustain their small group ministry through the circuit breaker or through lockdown times. And during that time, uh, after we designed this, this approach and, and field tested it, there were five churches that came on board to, to seek us, uh, even through the circuit breaker and just after that, you know, to, to engage this model uh, through this pandemic. And as we refine this model, we have begun to explore if we can use it for, for missions, you know, whether we can, uh, since it's online, can it be used in a mission setting? Because all the traditional mission trips are disrupted now. Can this be used in a missions way to help churches in developing uh, nations, to sustain their small group ministry in a time of lockdown? You know, and, but this, this moving away from what we used to do into this online approach, uh, uh, to develop something for this environment was very stressful. There was so much uncertainty I faced. And I kid you not, you know, uh, we sense a need to, to change. We didn't know what to do. We, everything was changing every other week. It was so stressful that at times I was sick that I had to go and see a doctor. No, I, mean, I, I kid you not. It's really, it was really a difficult time. But the journey was needed to let God shape my heart, to shape new paths for His ministry. Philip, uh, God said to me, Philip, when I first called you, it was to build strong churches all over the world, not just in Singapore. Can you not trust me that in a time of crisis, I will shape you to be uh, even closer to fulfilling my calling in you, not further? And perhaps for some of us, God is saying that to you. You're going through many changes in your work, your family, your ministry, difficult times, but God is saying, can you not trust me that through the crisis you're going through, I'm shaping you to become even closer, not further, but closer to fulfilling my call in your life. And not only individually, but as a church family. This is a time where God may speak new ideas into His church to shape how uh, she does ministry. And you know, if your leaders are seeking God and experimenting, you know, new things to try out, uh, no doubt it brings uncertainty. And we think, oh, why mu we must change, we must try something. We're not sure if it works, but it's part of that faith journey. And we need to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. We need to support our leaders. We need to pray for our leaders that they can discern, that they can hear the voice of Jesus Christ. Amen? That they can sense that this is what Christ, the Son of the living God, is speaking to risen Christ assembly if we want to see a breakthrough. Because at the end of the day, this is not our church. This is the church of Christ. And Jesus Christ deserves the best followership that we can give to the church because Christ is son of the living God and he is worth our following. Amen? 
And that's something very precious. You know, sometimes when we, when we get a sense of God's leading and we think, you know, maybe we should jump out and take a step of faith, and then we realize, wow, but, but wait, 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 there's quite a lot of risk, you know. Do we have enough resources? No, we, we are, we're not a big church. We're a small church. We don't have much resources to take this risk. Are you sure we can make a significant difference? Maybe it's better to play it safe, you know, to just hunker down, stick to safer, time-tested things, and then see how it goes. You know, and, 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 and that's what sometimes we think. But we forget that we have a mighty God. A God who wants to use RCA in this season to reach the loss. And God wants you to, to make that difference. You know, there's a prose I, I uh, found one time uh, that goes like this, and I thought I would share it with you. A basketball in my hands is worth about $19. A basketball in Michael Jordan's hands is worth about $33 million. Depends on whose hands it's in. A, a baseball in my hands is worth about $6. A baseball in Babe Ruth's hands is worth about $19 million. Right? It depends on whose hands it's in. A tennis racket is useless in my hands. A tennis racket in Pete Sampras' hands is a Wimbledon championship. Depends on whose hands it's in. A rod in my hands will keep a wild animal away. A rod in Moses' hand will part the Red Sea. It depends on whose hands it's in. A slingshot in my hands is a kid's toy. A slingshot in David's hands is a mighty weapon. It depends on whose hands it is in. Two fish and five loaves of bread in my hands are a couple of fish sandwiches. Two fish and five loaves of bread in God's hands will feed the thousands. It depends on whose hands it's in. Nails in my hands might produce a birdhouse, but nails in Jesus Christ's hands will produce salvation for the entire world. It depends on whose hands it's in. So as you can see now, the results depends on whose hands it's in. So put your concerns, your worries, your fears your hopes, your dreams, your families, and your relationships in God's hands. Because what happens depends on whose hands it's in. RCA, do you get a message? Your future impact does not depend on you. It depends on whose hands you're in. Your job is to make sure you are really in His hands. You're following Him all the way. And when you follow Him with all your all your heart because God can put a thousand to flight, He can put ten thousand to flight if the Lord your God is on your side. Turn to someone next to you, say to them, Great churches are obedient churches in the hands of a great God. Would you do that? Great churches are obedient churches in the hands of a great God. So be a people who hear and follow God radically. Pray for your leaders to have courage to have radical obedience to Christ. This is the time where I tell you that every leader faces the choice to play it safe or to discern what God says and to follow. And I want to encourage you to pray for them that they will have courage. They will listen to the voice of God. Finally, a prevailing church is a people who choose to trust God for power and growth. A people who choose to trust God for power and growth. Look with me at this well-known part of verse uh, 18 uh, of uh, Matthew 16. Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The word overcome here means to be able to prevail uh, or to defeat. It means that death and Hades will not defeat the driving force of the church. Now when you see this as a, an, an idiom, a Greek idiom, what it actually means is that Jesus is saying, under any circumstances, my church will never die out. My church will never die out under any situation. My church will always grow in any situation. And, and RCA, listen carefully. I think that this is a promise from God's word to you. If the believers and leaders here will step out of their boxes to follow the, the now leading of the Holy Spirit in radical obedience, the fullness of Christ's leadership will be experienced and regardless of any situation or difficulty, God will grow the church. No pandemic, no challenges, no uh, a difficult uh, urban uh, landscape will be able to defeat it. In my previous church experience when I pastor and I consult for churches, I've seen some ideas that work, some ideas that don't work. The ideas that work are not necessarily the best ideas sometimes. It may be the second best or the third best, but it has the unity of the people. The people just say, I feel that this is what God wants us to do. And they give their whole heart and they stand by it. 
you know, and, and, and they commit their faith and obedience. They trust God for authority and power. Friends, I want to say to you, united faith is so important. Uh, as when we move as one, God will pave the way, God will open the door. Look at me at verse 19, 19 of our verse. Jesus says not only to Peter, but I also believe he says this to all church leaders and people who will hear and radically obey God. He says this, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, keys open locked doors. We all know that. I know a church that does prison ministry and they reach people uh, in prison with the gospel. The, all, the prisoners sometimes look very depressed. They hear that the release date, the release date is coming. Oh, they're filled with hope. They're filled with joy. You know, and then suddenly if something happens, they hear that the release date is delayed. Oh, they feel so down, you know, again. Because the key is the symbol of authority. The key is the release date. The key is the authority. He who has uh, the, the, the authority to release that person from prison is the one, you know, that has authority. He who, who decides, I can lock you in for uh, another three more months is the one that has authority. And this is what this word here, bind here means. Bind means to tie up something, uh, uh, to change something as it were. To lose here means that you, you leave it alone, you remain unchanged. When you hear God's voice and when you say, I believe this to change, God will bless. When you hear God's voice and you say, no, this is good, it will remain, God will bless. Because you're not standing on your own word when you are uh, listening to the Holy Spirit, you're standing on prayer and, and obeying the Lord. So church, I want to encourage you to listen to God and to follow Him. It takes faith. Faith is crucial. Will you believe that God wants to bless your church? You know, those who did not believe, uh, Jesus would rather not involve them actually, you know, or not tell them. That's why Jesus went on to say for the outside people, they said, who will not believe? Look at me, verse 20. Verse 20 tells us this. Then He warned His disciples not to tell anyone that He was the Christ. You would have thought that at that point, why not tell the whole world? The revelation has been given. But He said, no, don't tell anyone. The outside people will not believe. And Jesus said, it's better for them not to know yet. RCA, are you those who will believe that God will bless your church? Do you believe God will bless your church? Can I see your hands? Amen? Those of you in, online also, wherever you are, I ask you, uh, raise your hands so that your spouse and your children and all around can see you. So I asked you earlier and I asked you just again, do you believe God wants to bless your church? You know, the story is told of a great circus performer by the name of Blondin and he stretched a long steel cable over the Niagara Falls. You know, if you have been there, very, very long distance between two uh, uh, cliffs. And during the high winds with no safety net, he walked, you know, he would run, you know, from one end of the wire to the other, run there. And then he would, sometimes he would even dance, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, it, over the, 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 the high wire in the midst of the Niagara Falls. And everyone was amazed. They were delighted, you know, the crowds who, who watched him. Once he took a wheelbarrow and he filled it with bricks and he put it on the wire and he wheeled it all the way there. To one and turned it off, wheeled it all the way back. And everyone said, wow, that's fantastic. And then Blondin turned to the crowd. How many of you believe that I can push a man across the wire in the wheelbarrow? Everyone put up their hands. Look, all, all the hands raised up. Everyone cheered. Do you want me to do it? Yeah! Then he asked, who will volunteer to go into the wheelbarrow? All the hands went down. Not even one hand. Not one person would volunteer to ride in the wheelbarrow to trust his life to Blondin. Many people will say to Jesus, I believe you will bless RCA. I believe that you will bless our church. If you are among those, then get into the wheelbarrow. Get into the wheelbarrow of faith. Faith is not just an intellectual exercise. It requires commitment. And we need to say, when it's time, when it's time for me to serve, when it's time for me to reach out to someone, it's time to take a step of faith, God, you count me in. My hand is up. I will do it. Amen? Turn to someone next to you and say to them, get into the wheelbarrow of faith. Would you do that? Those online, tell your loved ones, get into the wheelbarrow of faith. I want to invite worship team to come up and take positions. You know, in my time of studies in the US, as part of our school curriculum, we met a senior pastor of a huge church and we interviewed him. And we asked him, what grew the church? At the time, it had reached 15,000 members. Okay, very big church. And this senior pastor stood up to a, a, a people who are studying their doctoral ministries you know, in church health and church growth. And what grows the church? And we thought, oh, he's going to talk about strategy, vision, direction, you know, techniques, unity. We, all, we thought about all that. But he didn't say all that. He said, 
You may think that all of us did such a great job that we all built this great church. But I, as the senior pastor, want to tell you, we did a small part. God did the major part. God was the one who led us. We just made sure that certain key things were a priority. When God said, these are the few things that are a priority, we all in unity said, these are the things we will make a priority. And we just did those things with all our heart. If God chose us to do this, we followed God with all our heart. It's like there was this basketball game. Michael Jordan was the champion of the game that night. He, he scored 69 points in that one basketball game. And they were all so far in the lead uh, that the coach said, I'm going to give Michael Jordan a rest, take him off, you know, and put a, a substitute, you know, a little known substitute there. And the substitute plays, plays in the last few minutes of the game, right? He shoots two free throws, you know, and scores two points, you know, which is quite meaningless, you know, for, for the whole thing. But he was the player that replaced Michael Jordan. So he was interviewed by reporters and he was asked, can I ask you, what is the highlight of your career? He replied, the highlight of my career was the night I and Michael Jordan scored 71 points in a game. <laughs> God grows the church with me, but He will do the major part. I will play the minor part, but He will grow the church and I will follow Him with all my heart. Friends, is your vision of God too small? Have you been locked in just because of the resources, the size that you have? Jesus Christ says, I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. This is the word of God. I will build my church. Let all enemies beware. The gate of Hades will not prevail against it. That is God's word to us. Come, let us pray.